Texas Stingray at SeaWorld San Antonio is the newest wooden roller coaster from Great Coasters International. The ride opened in late February of 2020, just a few weeks before SeaWorld San Antonio and every park across the United States closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And to be honest, had the ride not opened before the COVID shutdown, I suspect it would have been postponed until 2021, just like the other new roller coasters being at the SeaWorld and Busch Gardens parks. So I think enthusiasts were rather lucky the ride was erected so quickly. This was the sixth roller coaster at SeaWorld San Antonio, and the first wooden roller coaster built at a park with the SeaWorld name. But it was not the first wood coaster built by the SeaWorld Parks and Entertainment Corporation. The chain previously built Gwazi at Busch Gardens Tampa in 1999, a dueling wooden roller coaster also from GCI. However, that ride became horrifically rough and ultimately it closed in 2015 before being converted into Iron Gwazi for the 2021 season. Then in 2017, the chain returned to GCI to add Invader at Busch Gardens Williamsburg. Possibly because of their experience with Gwazi, this family wooden coaster was built as a hybrid coaster with a steel support structure as opposed to Gwazi's all wooden support structure. When it came time for SeaWorld San Antonio to add a wood coaster, the chain again turned to GCI and again chose to go with a support structure made of steel. And that was probably a prudent decision considering the harsh Texas heat. Texas Stingray was marketed as the tallest, fastest, and longest wooden roller coaster in all of Texas. Texas Stingray only tied Boardwalk Bullet for the tallest wood coaster in Texas, as both rides stand 96 feet or 29 meters tall. But Texas Stingray did narrowly edge Boardwalk Bullet in the speed department with a top speed of 55 miles per hour or 88.5 kilometers per hour, and the length department with a length of 3,379 feet or 1,030 meters. Texas Stingray starts off as a twister in the first half before feeling more like an out-and-back coaster in the second half. And when viewed from above, the ride looks reminiscent of a Stingray, hence the ride's name. The coaster is located in the far corner of the park near Orca Stadium. And on that note, I strongly recommend avoiding this coaster after the Orca Encounter show concludes. That show holds a ton of people, and once it ends, many of them will flock into the queue line for Texas Stingray since it's right there. A similar effect happens after a show at the Nautilus Theater concludes, but that is a much smaller theater so it's not quite as bad. I visited SeaWorld San Antonio three times this past December, but was only able to ride Texas Stingray on one of those days. The first day had rain all day, so the park never opened any of the coasters, so keep this in mind that the forecast looks grim on the day you plan to visit. The second day was a Sunday. Texas Stingray started off with one train, so the line moved at a snail's pace, especially since only half the rows were available due to COVID. The line kept growing, but they put a second train on later in the day, and that turned Texas Stingray into a walk-on. So I marathoned it for an hour at night until the ride closed due to low temperatures, and that's something I'll touch on in a bit. On the following weekend, I popped in after visiting Six Flags Fiesta Texas, but chose to skip Texas Stingray because they had a lengthy queue line and just one train in use. Now normally, I wouldn't hesitate to buy a skip the line pass to make sure I can get on the best rides, but it was not particularly useful here. Whenever the SeaWorld parks open a new ride, they typically make it an expensive one-time upcharge on the highest tiered quick queue for at least the first year after the ride's opening. The station is rather bare, but it constantly plays country music as you'd expect for a ride named after Texas. And the trains in the station look great. They're sleek with their red, white, and blue color scheme, and I absolutely love this Stingray-themed lead car. Unlike many of the other GCIs, Texas Stingray has no seatbelts. It has just the familiar lap bar that will constantly lower throughout the ride. For that reason, I strongly recommend that you hold on to it unless you want to get stapled. In terms of seat selection, I was torn whether I preferred the front or back row. I think the back is superior for the first half, but the front is better for the second half, so you should try both. One factor you need to consider as I move through this review are the weather conditions in which I rode Texas Stingray. Wood coasters in particular are notorious for running faster in the heat. I rode Texas Stingray on a day when the temperature was in the 50s, so I suspect the ride was not running to its fullest potential. 
However, the ride still held its speed incredibly well start to finish. I'm guessing if the ride experience suffered, the airtime may have lost some of its power. But considering how fast it felt even in the cooler weather, I am salivating to know just how fast this ride runs on a hot summer day. After ascending the 96 foot tall lift to some more country music, you turn to the right and descend down a 100 foot or 30 and a half meter tall drop. And unlike most GCI drops that twist, Texas Stingray has a straight drop. And it's the reason why I split my rides between the front and back. This drop delivered some sustained floater airtime you don't typically get on a GCI. That is followed by a sizable second hill. Up front, you get sustained floater airtime. In the back, you don't get any airtime on this hill. Instead, you get some decent laterals on the descent. The following turnaround gives a powerful pop of airtime up front. But like the prior hill, the back gets no airtime. Instead, you get another dose of laterals on the twisting descent. That is followed by another smaller turnaround. The entrance offers sustained floater airtime up front, but the drop on the other side is a double down. The first part of the drop is curved, so it offers no airtime nor laterals. But the second part of the drop is this little speed hill that gives back row riders some mild floater airtime. You then fly over an elongated S hill. No matter where you sit, you are going to get some glorious sustained floater airtime. You then dip below the ride structure in a very surprising and terrifying head chopper. It's a very underrated element on this ride. But unfortunately, this drop did not have for any airtime despite how quickly you fly over it. You then whip over this off axis speed hill that gives a really abrupt pop of ejector airtime. It's probably the most powerful airtime moment on the entire ride, especially since you're sort of on your side for it. You then rip over a speed hill that gives some decent floater airtime, and then you haul around the far turnaround. Then comes the return leg. As I mentioned earlier, speed was not an issue during this section of the ride, but the airtime was definitely an issue. The drop into the tunnel gives some great sustained floater airtime in the back, and it catches you off guard just how tall this drop is. And then the final hill gives some very weak sustained floater airtime up front, but none of the other hills gave any airtime. The sense of speed up front is able to overcome this to an extent, but it seemed odd that these hills didn't have any airtime considering the speed at which you took them. This is the part of the ride I suspect was most impacted by me visiting the park in December. So if anyone has ridden Texas Stingray on a warmer day, definitely let me know if the return leg usually has more airtime than I experienced. Since this coaster isn't even a year old, the ride is about as smooth as a wood coaster can reasonably be. That's how most GCIs start off. Whether or not they stay smooth depends on the park's maintenance, but hopefully Texas Stingray remains smooth over its lifespan. So what would I rank Texas Stingray? I would give this coaster an 8 out of 10. It is a fast paced flurry of elements like I've come to expect from GCI. I love how the ride feels like a twister in the first half and an out and back in the second half. Most coasters are one or the other, but not both. The airtime in the first half is great, especially because of how diverse it is, ranging from sustained floater to some ejector pops. But the reason I took some points away was because the second half just didn't have the airtime I was looking for. I think Steel Eel is still the best coaster at SeaWorld San Antonio, but Texas Stingray is a solid number two, especially since I rode it in the least favorable conditions possible for a wood coaster, and it still felt quite fast. And then compared to the other GCIs, I'd say it's towards the upper end of the middle tier. The airtime isn't quite as consistent in start to finish as the other coasters, but Texas Stingray's best moments are some of GCI's best because it's rare to get sustained airtime on their coasters. So those are my thoughts on Texas Stingray. Have you been on SeaWorld's newest roller coaster? I would love to hear your thoughts down in the comments. If you enjoyed this review, I'd appreciate if you gave this video a like and you considered subscribing because there'll be a lot more roller coaster and amuse park videos here at Canopy Coaster. Thanks for watching.